I heard about this semi pretty advanced uh, for the time UX book called Mental Models by Indy Young. Um, and in it, it had this sidebar um, by Jesse James Garrett. Um, if you haven't heard of him, these are all adaptive path folks. And he had this formula um, where he defined uh, UX strategy as business strategy plus UX strategy equals experience strategy. And um, I was trying to make sense of it. You know, it sounded kind of Shakespearean, you know, ought not evolve in isolation. And then I started doing deduction and saying, well, if I got rid of the word strategy, does UX plus business equal experience? And I thought maybe if you took acid, which Jesse probably did, and <laughs> I just wasn't satisfied. He's a great guy. Um, uh, that this really gave me you know, a, a true understanding of what UX strategy was. And so I then searched you know, all the articles on the internet. And I realized that there was just like this huge knowledge gap around what UX strategy was. And that was probably what inspired me to write a book about it. The reason I don't like this one is because it basically um, is saying that when you set out um, on your strategic mission, you're saying, okay, that's, you know, I, that, you know, there it is, there's our North Star, we're going to go straight to that, and we aren't going to be deterred. And the problem with that, and especially if you've read Lean Startup or listened to Dan yesterday, um, is that when you're doing strategy, it actually needs to be iterative just like the design process. Like you don't know unless you do experiments and testing. And so deciding, you know, after maybe a one or three week discovery session, like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Here's our product strategy, um, I feel is um, neglectful. So then there's this other thing. Um, this one is UX strategy is a strategic way to form UX design, perform, right? So like, it's like as if, like if you substitute the word uh, UX for toilet, right? And say toilet strategy, you know, like is there a strategic way to go to the toilet or is it tactical, right? Like why is all of a sudden our process of doing UX strategy um, the UX strategy, like why don't we just hire a UX ops person to manage the UX strategy um, if it's really just about the process or, you know, who's going to be on our UX team and what are the different, you know, uh, plays in our playbook. I love that one, the playbook, um, especially when they're not written by jocks. Um, so I don't like that either because to me UX strategy should be more about the actual value proposition and product strategy. Um, not just like how the organization, what's their strategy for UX, but that's the most common misinterpretation to me. Um, so then this third one is it's just product strategy, and I use them synonymously just to make it easier for people, but the truth of the matter is, is UX strategy um, can be for service design, so what, it's not a product, or it can be for a platform, like I was talking about doing platform strategy with digital transformation, or it could be for doing hybrid, you know, digital and non-digital products, or if you think about like Apple, you know, they have everything that's offline, they have the, uh, the Genius Bar, the Apple Store experience, all very much tied into their online experience, and so, user experience, you know, crosses, you know, and customer experience really crosses over so many more boundaries than just simple product strategy, so I don't use that so much. And then just time, like saying it's just another form of brand strategy, um, that was kind of what people would say when UX still hadn't like proved itself as in terms of its return on investment. Um, but these days everyone knows like a good, you have to have a good UX no matter what. Um, so it's not just like about the brand. The brand can't just be like, it's an amazing UX. It also needs to have a unique value proposition. So what the heck is user experience strategy according to Jamie Levy? Um, so I make it real simple. I say it's the intersection of UX design and business strategy. Um, it's just, I, I put a video of the um, Niagara Falls there because it's pretty, you know. 
I had the Sex Pistols and people were like thinking it was weird, so I changed it. Um, <laughs> so um, it's also a plan of action on how to ascertain that the user experience of the product is aligned with the business objectives, right? That's the idea, right? Tying the, like, what's the, the, the user loves it, and so thus the business makes money. Um, and then uh, it's a method by which we validate that the solution solves a problem for real customers in a dynamic marketplace. Um, you know, the keywords here being we validate, the, that means we find out, you know, often we're actually finding out that we're wrong, but this idea that we're constantly testing our strategic assumptions, you know, these are hypotheses that need to be proven true or false and that we need to tackle things and make sure like that the solution is something that the customer wants, that it's unique, um, and that the marketplace is dynamic uh, because it's always constantly changing. There's new companies springing up and getting funding, other companies disappearing or pivoting. And so it's really, you know, doing UX strategy is not something you just do at the very beginning. It's something that's constantly done um, throughout um, the company's life cycle. Um, and then most importantly, and this really is going to, um, you'll, you'll fill this today, is it should be done empirically. You know, one thing that bored me, not bored me, frustrated me about being a designer was the subjectivity of it, you know, where someone could look at something and say, I hate that, you know, because they didn't like purple, and, you know, I like purple, obviously, and they liked, they wanted another color, and, and it, there wasn't really, you know, subjectivity, they liked it or they didn't like it and I liked it or, you know, and I just like, I decided I wanted to move into something that was more objective and why I like strategy is you can, you, we're building evidence. We're trying to build a case to convince people um, that, you know, this is why we think the product should be like this. And so, and by doing it in an empirical and systematic way, it's a much, you know, better guarantee of de-risking our value proposition than just crossing our fingers, writing a bunch of code, and you know, designing a bunch of wires. Here's my formula. I did it first like this on a chalkboard, right? Um, then I made it look like this, much nicer, right? Instead, it's uh, plates on my dinner table at home. Um, like tapas, you wanna eat a little bit out of each one. And I'm gonna explain these four tenants right now. So the first one is business strategy, and this is the one that this uh, workshop is really focused on. Um, the business strategy is the plans, choices, and decisions that a company makes to guide themselves to greater profitability. Um, obviously, this is getting into having a business model that's sustainable, uh, evolving it as the market changes. Um, but uh, for a lot of people coming from the design world, um, they don't understand uh, business strategy because they don't have MBAs. And so they're uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they're giving a, a, a you know, product requirements deck or design specifications or a vision deck, and, and, they, and they aren't really thinking about it. They're not, or maybe they aren't even given that. They're, they're just saying, they're just, they just start designing away, and they're not really aware of, like, hey, there's a product that does exactly what you're doing, but better out there in the marketplace. And I feel like um, that disconnect is, um, you know, why we see um, just like so many bad products out there, or products that don't make it, is like that people are just like making stuff without really understanding the marketplace. Starbucks, um, Star, uh, was basically just selling roasted beans when they started, I guess in Portland or was it Seattle. Seattle, same thing, right? Oh, but not anymore. Okay, so Seattle. And um, I'm just kidding, I know they're different. So, uh, <laughs> they're, they're really close, but they're different. One, one has been completely taken over by Amazon and the other one hasn't. So, <laughs> like Seattle is so not what it was. Um, so anyway, roasted beans, let's get back to that thought, and uh, Howard Schultz, New York business tycoon, or uh, ish, he comes out there and he sees what they're doing and he's thinking how can this company do better, make more money, uh, 
he goes on this trip to Italy. He goes to a, a, a cafe in Milan. He walks in. You know, they, he orders this cappuccino, and, and they ask his name, and it's, you know, and give it to him, and it's all frothy, and he sits down, and he, uh, and he sees that people are hanging out, you know, the coffee culture in Europe, and people really take it seriously. Um, I mean, now we do here, but thanks to Starbucks. And he saw this, you know, as that coffee is a cultural experience in Europe, and he wanted to bring that concept back to America. And, you know, long story short, ultimately Starbucks caved in and let him start selling coffees such as lattes and cappuccinos and crappa frappuccinos that people would be happy, are happy to pay $5 for because it's so much better than what we had before, like instant coffee. Or when I went to NYU, I would pick up like a crappy coffee from a bodega. Like coffee wasn't an experience. It was just something to give me caffeine to wake up. And so the whole experience of coffee is the differentiation. That's why people, that's why we pay so much to have the, this higher quality level of coffee. And differentiation is something that we really need to think about when we're talking about having a competitive advantage for the software that we create. Because people ultimately are gonna pick the best experience, right? It's, uh, in most cases, sometimes they'll look at the lower price point, but differentiation really makes a difference. Basically, we're seeing all the nine components now in this grid. And the idea is that you could just kind of plug and play with them, and that it's kind of like um, basically like a Rubik's Cube. And you could potentially uh, you know, try out, like, well, these could be our partners. And this is what you're doing before you actually uh, are coming up with the business model for uh, a product or service or a company. Um, and the ones on the right side here are really important. If you look at them, they're, ex they're like basically closely tied to UX strategy. Because we're doing strategy, we're talking about the value proposition, we're figuring out how the customer is gonna interact with our, our service or product, that's the customer experience. We're talking about how we're gonna market it, how it's gonna go viral, if we're gonna be using social media, that's the channels. We're talking about customer segments, who is our primary customer segment. So, you know, most products aren't for everyone, or there's going to be a certain segment of people that need it the most and figuring out who they are. And then the revenue streams. And all of these are basically like, imagine them to be puzzle pieces that you can experiment and make a, here's one version of it, and then make, you know, do another. And, and, and there's versions of this on the, on the web to play with and making these canvases. And there's another canvas, by the way, called the Lean Canvas by Ash Maria, um, which is good. A famous Belosian strategy case study is uh, the Ford Model T. And the big idea is that uh, Henry Ford borrowed the idea of a uh, uh, production line and said, okay, um, right now, cars in America, this is right now, 1908, <laughs> over 100 years ago, um, cars in, in America were very expensive. Only rich people could have them. They were built custom. Um, and then they would have a lot of problems when they broke down because there are so many different kinds. And so he got the big idea like that he would uh, build basically an assembly line and that people would work on the assembly line so that he could just make one car one color, right, one model, and just make that one over and over. And if that doesn't sound familiar, it should, because that's basically, Steve Jobs did the same thing um, with the iPhone when it started, and he did that when he came back to Apple by really trying to simplify what, what it was, what their offering was. But ultimately, he brought the cost down to $850, and there was all of a sudden, like middle class people, even people that worked on his assembly line, could afford cars. And innovation can happen when you reimagine an offline experience 
with a really great interface. Case in point, hitchhiking. All right, women in the room, how many of you would pick up this hoodie guy? <laughs> uh, all right, imagine your kid's in the car. Okay, no kid in the car. You're alone. You're alone at night, hoodie guy. No? No? None of you? Okay. How about hoodie guys? Would you guys hitchhike, right? <laughs> and truck drivers coming by. Would you get into the truck? No, but you want to get from point A to point B. So there's no one in the room that would get into a stranger's car, let a stranger get into their car? Right. So then all along calls it's Uber, sure, right? And all of a sudden you just like, you know, it knows where you are and it shows that there's like eight cop cars about to come pick you up. And but grandpa shows up. He really was a grandpa. I talked to him. I'm not being ageist. And he and I asked him, I said, Hey grandpa, um, why are you an Uber driver? I said, what the hell? Um, and he, is, is it dangerous? He's like, oh, no, it's nothing. He was in San Francisco. He's like, it's been great. I, I get pocket money. I get, away, get to get out. You know, I got bored gardening, and I love it. And, um, and so, you know, I, was a, I got into a stranger's car, and he let a stranger get into my car, and that was because we trusted that the Uber interface was, you know, with the reviews on both sides, that it would be a safe experience. They changed the mental model of hitchhiking.